two, one. Radio. All right. Welcome to your Ron and Amy show. We haven't done one of these in a long time, Amy. Way too long. Yeah, Way too long. You, on. They, they, you know, we somebody said they did they do Kavanaugh already. We should have done Kavanaugh. You're the lawyer. Oh, <laughs> gosh. No, 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 no. What I said no. about Kavanaugh. So um, anyway, we're not going to do Kavanaugh. I'm the just... the only the only thing I had about Kavanaugh was that I heard he's pretty bad on the Fourth Amendment. And I read a quotation from him that sounded not good. So I had no, no, no sexual harassment. We're supposed to do sex. Not none of this legal philosophy. Who cares about legal? I know that bores everybody, Did but he, or didn't he, you know, should we believe women? Should we always believe women, no matter what, take them at face value and persecute men just because a woman complains about him? I have only one observation that I had, and that was, it was her testimony she used a lot of technical psychological terminology yeah, yeah and that made me a little bit suspicious but that's all i had because i mean this she's a she's a psychologist so it, it, it's not too whoops what that, oh, I wanna, <laughs> some pop-up video <laughs> went on okay um, so so your own i came up with the title right you did. and you it's did. Okay. The, the, uh, the price of pragmatism and people can check out the program notes at my blog at don't let it um, your mission, should you choose to accept it is to help me shoehorn every single thing in the program notes into that theme, no matter what, <laughs> isn't that what a good pragmatist does anyway, though? Right. Yeah. I've got a few questions about a few of the stories, so we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll pragmatism. I, I will explain what I had in mind or if I had anything in mind or if I was counting on you to save me with each one. All right. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see in a minute. Good? So, yeah. So everybody who's listening, just go to don't let it go.com and you can check out the program notes and you can sit in suspense about whether we're going to be able to fit all of this into the theme. I think the first one's pretty easy, though, right? You're wrong. What's the, the, first first one? pretty, the first one's about trade tariffs. Yeah, probably tired. I mean, I know all my listeners are already tired of me going after this trade stuff. Well, I, I have I have a question for you yes. that occurred to me after watching your show from the other day. Okay. And so I think it's something that hopefully will appeal to people because I'm actually going to press you on something a little bit. I'm going to challenge you. All right. Okay. Sorry. Should I have warned you? <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I okay. love being in the spot. You know me. Okay. So it's going to be a little, a little bit different, but the, the first story is very predictable from your and my perspective, yep. which is that Ford is preparing for mass layoffs after losing $1 billion to Trump's trade tariffs. You know, where are his subsidies, right? You well, were talking getting, about subsidies they're yesterday. Coming. Yeah. They're coming. I'm sure they're coming. I mean, the ethanol guys got them and he won, you know, uh, 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 he won Michigan and he'll need to win Michigan in 2020 to win the presidency. So he, he might, he'll he probably bail out the auto industry in some way. Um, but you know, Ford, last time I remember, Ford refused the bailouts, which made me think more of them. I've never purchased a Ford car, but I considered it. I know. I, know. Yeah. I did not want to. I was never going to buy quite a, a GM again, but Ford I would consider. But, um, you know, he's bailed out the, the, the soybean farmers, and now he's talking about bailing out the ethanol right. the farmers and the ethanol producers. You know, he's going to compete with uh, Bob Dole as being – Bob Dole used to be called the ethanol senator because he used to – be, be the guy who pitched ethanol, 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 because of course his state, I think it was Kansas, uh, was an ethanol producer and he became the right. crony ethanol guy. And Trump is going to be an ethanol guy as well, the ethanol president. Um, I think there'll be a, yeah, there'll be a bailout for Ford. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. The federal government, our commander in chief, our central planner in chief, will not let anybody lose from his tariffs. Everybody. Well, not anybody win, who. Win, win, win. I was going to say, he won't let anybody lose if his staying in power depends on them not losing, right? You know, other, otherwise, they're all supposed to, you know, kind of sacrifice for the good of America first and the, and the trade. So what's the challenge? I'm waiting for the challenge. Okay, I'll give, I'll give you the challenge. But just to let people know, Ford's stock is down 29%. And, you know, as we said in the headline, it costs the company, the tariffs have cost the company $1 billion. And they're now announcing layoffs. They're working to engineer a $25.5 billion restructuring. They want to cut costs and remain competitive, as according to the Wall Street Journal. 
Auto sales are down. One reason is the trade tariffs. According to Bloomberg, Hackett has said that they've already cost $1 billion in profit and could do more damage if the disputes aren't resolved quickly. So this is no surprise, right? This is the cost of the tariffs. And you would say that this is a result of pragmatism, right? In the sense that we do not have a principled policy that is leading us to do this, right? Yeah, no. I mean, obviously, uh, Trump is is the ultimate in in um, pragmatic president, and uh, you know, tariffs an example of short term satisfying voters, satisfying rhetoric, and and no thinking about the long term consequences, no thinking about economic principle. Put aside any other kind of principle. Put aside right. moral principle. Or, or political philosophical principle, but but economic no thinking of economic principle. Yeah, I mean I mean the whole tariff agenda is a prag- pragmatist agenda, and it's but it's this is the problem with with this and that in a sense Trump is worse than a pragmatist. That is, a pragmatist has to make some kind of economic some kind of practical argument why this would work. There is no argument for tariffs. Zero. Well, I mean, the one that we're trying to just either retaliate or we're using it to get them to lower tariffs or to have other sorts of influence no over North Korea in the case of China, that kind no of indication thing. that's the case. I mean, a, a good example is, um, is what do you call it? Um, uh, the NAFTA 1.2 or whatever he wants to call it, the new NAFTA agreement. I mean, it just basically changed the game uh, of who are the cronies, who gets what. It didn't fundamentally free up trade any more than it was before. It didn't make it fairer in any kind of sense. All it did was reshuffle deck in terms of who are the cronies, who benefits from who, who ben- you know, who gets the goodies. So it's the same as always. It's a kind of a managed trade, um, and, and he hasn't done So there's no evidence he's for true free trade. I mean, that's just a, that's just a, a rationalization by those who don't want to think badly of Donald Trump. And, and to go back to the gloss of pragmatism that I have found so useful in my work, William James says, for a pragmatist, the good is simply satisfying demand. Yeah. And that if you're really trying to be the best pragmatist, then you're going to try to satisfy as many demands as possible. A Donald Trump tra- type of pragmatist is transparently trying to satisfy the demands of people whose votes that he wants, basically. Yes, he, he wants yes. And, and, and satisfy the demand that he's created. So he went out there and to some extent, you know, uh, blamed all our problems on trade, blamed all our problems on foreigners, blamed all our problems on these things. He can't walk back from that. So he has to act it out. So he has to satisfy the demand that in, in some respects always was there, but in some respects he created and intensified. So people were suspicious of trade, but he magnified that suspicion. He made it a massive electoral issue. And now he has to live up to it by, by you know, pretending to be fighting for America in this, in this trade thing. So here's the challenge. The other day in your Q&A, they were asking you about um, protecting international shipping lanes, yeah. right? And yeah. you said, and I agree, you know, if these are international lanes and we're trying, you know, for example, we have a ship that's going someplace yeah. where it has every right to go and, you know, there's a demand for stuff and everything, we're just trading. And then some pirates or otherwise come and interfere with our safe passage through that, then we're justified in retaliating and you know doing what is necessary to keep those lanes open, protecting American businesses who are you know using these lanes. Yep. Um, you could almost argue in that sense that there's you know there's only certain businesses that are benefiting from those types of efforts, and you know how should a cost for that sort of protection be distributed? And we could, you know, have a discussion about that. But then you talked about also if there was a coup in a country that had been free, and then of course that was cutting off trade and maybe why be, why we, you know, we'd be justified in doing something there. Would it be right to spend a military budget to do it or to sacrifice American lives to go into a country where there'd been a coup just in order to maintain free trade. Some people see tariffs as simply 
you know, diverting American resources to pressure these other countries to open up trade because in effect, you know, China's doing the same thing as interfering with international trade. You know, it's, it's, it's the same principle in effect. So how are tariffs different uh, than that? I don't know. There's so much wrong there. Okay. Let me, let me start with this, right? I, I said, so let's say I live in Texas. I, I can't use Puerto Rico for a variety of reasons. So let's say I live in Texas. You live in, in California. And there's a mass murder in California. Texas is like incredibly peaceful, but there's a mass murder in California. Joe's going to love you right now, by the way, but he hasn't listened to our show anyway. So go ahead. And FBI, (laughs) you know, FBI is sent to California to catch a mass murderer. And my tax money is going to California to catch a mass murderer. Look, that's that's the purpose of taxes. And everybody benefits. Everybody, no matter where, when violations of rights occur, then everybody benefits from the violator being caught and prosecuted and put into jail. When the shipping lanes are obstructed, and, and, and that's a violation of property rights, um, you know, so, so if people, if there's a lot of focus on catching Bernie Madoff, hey, I didn't invest in Bernie Madoff, why are you trying to catch him, right? But the principle is any violator of rights harms all of us. And, it, and that is true on the shipping lanes as well. So it doesn't change militarily. Hey, the terrorists are not after me. They're just after those guys over there who, I don't know, blaspheme Islam. Why should I spend my tax money protecting them? So, so, so how about so China harms all of us? So let's, let's just do the role of government. The role of government is to protect individual rights, right? And now I said that the whole idea of a coup, it's tricky. It's, it's not clear to me exactly where the boundaries are and where you would actually expend American resources and where you wouldn't. And so, so it's difficult to tell, and I, I didn't come down hard on one side or not, or the other one. Now, tariffs are, are something completely different, right? Um, no force was used on American producers. Um, no force was used on American uh, traders uh, in the, the application of tariffs in China. That force was used on Chinese citizens, not on Americans. Tariffs are a, a domestic, consumption tax. So when when Donald Trump raises tariffs, he's raising taxes on Americans. Now, the consequence of that, we hope, it doesn't work this way, but we hope, is that we reduce our demand for those goods, and that hurts the Chinese. And to some extent, that's happening, right? So we reduce the demand for these things, and it hurts the Chinese. Or when China raises the tariffs on American goods, because it reduces the demand, but that's not violating the rights of Americans. That's, vi- I mean, when the Chinese do it, when Donald Trump does it, it sure is violating the rights of Americans. So it's, it's never appropriate. This is a principle, I think. It's never appropriate to violate somebody's rights in order to secure rights somewhere else. Okay, so then we should maybe talk about how some of this stuff should be paid for, right? In an ideal society. Because right now, if we were going to defend these shippers in the international shipping lanes, it just comes from all of our taxes. But it could be that there would be, you know, as Rand proposed in the thing that's relevant only way down the road when we change the society totally. But she said, you know, there's some sort of a stamp tax on contracts and people pay about 3% of the value of the contracts in order to pay yeah, for all this stuff. Contracts, right? You could have a yeah. fee on international contracts. And as part of that, the US government protects the shipping lanes or all our taxes are voluntary. And look, all of us benefit, right? I mean, I mean, th- another example that occurred to me, another example is the um, Middle Eastern countries nationalizing the Western oil. Right. Yeah. Should have gone in there and done something militarily. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And. But again, that's that's part of what you pay for when you pay taxes voluntarily in an ideal society. Mm -hmm. You are paying taxes so that individual rights are protected. Individual rights of Americans are protected. You're not paying taxes just so your rights are protected. Everybody's rights are protected because you realize that if my neighbor's rights are violated, I'm next. If his rights are not going to be protected, mine will not be protected. So we voluntarily pay into the system in order to protect, you know, the rights of American citizens, the rights to, 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 uh, of, uh, you, you know, life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. It doesn't say my right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It, it, it is my right, but by extension. You're not paying 
this is the difference. You know, the anarchists would say, no, 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 you're on. You're being a collectivist. What's this our rights? What's this my rights? Mm-hmm. You should pay a specific police force, a specific government that only protects you and has only your interest in mind. But that is a perversion. That's a perversion of the concept of rights. And it's a perversion of the idea of what a government, how a government functions and how a government serves. So the role of the government is to protect individual rights. We pay taxes voluntarily so that it does its function. And that includes protecting the rights of people that I don't know. But I know that that's good for me because I want to live in a world where rights are protected. Now take the shipping lanes. I'm a consumer. I mean, if, the, if there's pirates and ships are going missing, then the cost of goods is going to go up. All the stuff that I buy is going to become more expensive. So I'm, again, benefiting enormously from the fact that there's protection of the shipping lanes. Okay. And this is different from the tariffs because the rights violations in the case of tariffs are against their own citizens, well, not, not ours. As much. It's different from the tariffs for a lot of reasons. One is, again, you don't fix a problem by creating one. You don't fix a problem by, by you don't fix a rights violation by violating rights. So you don't increase taxes on me because the Chinese are doing something screwed up. If I voluntarily in a, in a laissez-faire society give taxes, then that's fine. But you don't, you don't, um, you, you don't violate my rights for that. And, and then the second thing is that the Chinese are not violating my rights or Americans' rights by raising tariffs locally. Or take the Canadians. We've still got steel tariffs on Canada. Take the Canadians. They have tariffs on, and, and they still have tariffs on uh, milk. They just have lower tariffs with the new NAFTA, NAFTA 1.0. 1.2. Um, so uh, they have to have some milk, but they have, that's a tax on their own citizens. Now, yes, Americans suffer, mm-hmm. but it's not a violation of rights. Yeah, it, I just see it as like, you know, people are making these investments. But and- let me add also this, yeah. that, you know, um, what was I going to say? Um, I don't think his goal is to reduce tariffs. I, I don't believe him that that's his goal. But, you know, put that aside. Uh, you were going to say people are making investments. Yeah, and they're benefiting from government protection. So people are making investments around the corner, building a building not far from you. And they're, they're assuming that when the thieves come at night to steal the metal because they can sell it on the black market, the police will be there to stop them. And that we are all paying taxes to protect their property. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. And so we have, a, we have an incentive to do that because we want economic activity to occur. We want, but more fundamentally, we want rights to be protected as a principle, right? This is not, I mean, that's the pragmatic versus principled approach. The pragmatic approach would say, well, wait a minute, you know, nobody's stealing from me. I don't want to pay for those guys. But a principled approach says, no. This is the role of government, and I'm willing to pay for the government to do what it's supposed to do because I benefit from it in a million ways, even though pragmatically, I can't see it right now. I can't see the cost benefit right now. I, I you know, the analytic philosopher, I, you know, I was trained, I got my PhD in philosophy, so I'm probably polluted a little bit. I can come up with some crazy hypothetical examples to try to press this more, but maybe that's enough for now. And I'll, I mean, you I'll can, but it's, but, but no, this is not hard. I don't think this is hard. Okay. 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 I'm thinking of weird things like, you know, you can pass through the international shipping lane, but we're going to charge you a tax as you go through, say the Chinese or whoever's going to. Oh, if the Chinese do that, then no, then this is gunboat diplomacy of the 19th century. No, you know, if it's international shipping lanes, we blow you out of the water. That's that's the nice thing about being a superpower. Uh, You you don't allow that. That's 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 being a pirate. Um, So but but then the message is like if, if I want to, for example, invest in a whole new business that is going to satisfy the demand of some people in France, for example, let's just take, you know, some country that I don't know anything about trade wise. Um, Basically I am taking a risk that the French are going to continue to be rational about allowing imports and not either, you know, impose some new tariff or drastically increase tariffs. And it's on me. It's not the American government's job to, you know, ensure my investment, so to speak. 
Well, okay. it, it's it's not clear. I think this is much more complicated. That is, and I've said this on other occasions. So, um, I think the U.S. government would publish lists of different countries, and they would say, okay, these countries are basically right protecting countries, and if 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 they confiscate your stuff, we will use everything in our diplomacy, everything in our ability to help you. That's what we have a State Department. The only role of a State Department should be to help American citizens when they get into trouble overseas. And, and that includes property rights. Then there's a list of countries you're not allowed to do business with. Right. Because they're the enemy. Security, yeah. There's a list of countries that say, look, you're on your own if you go there, right? But it has to be explicit. You're on your own. We cannot protect you if you go there. Um, we will try to protect you in these other countries, but here, we cannot protect you. Uh, and, and I would say those countries are bad countries that are probably going to confiscate property rights, but that we wouldn't go to war on. Um, but Saudi Arabia would be a country where beware. But, you know, you know, if it's if it's we, we could protect you because they're insignificant enough. Right. It's not going to lead to a world war. It's not like China. China is one of those countries where we say beware. And if you get into trouble, We'll try to help, but you're probably on your own. Okay. 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 Fair, fair enough this answer. Is why, this is why things like foreign policy are not straightforward and easy. And, and, and it's not like in an objectivist world, oh, yeah, well, one, two, three, bam, 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 it's rational. It, you know, it's just easy to do. No, there's a lot of thinking that has to go into what constitutes a relationship with other countries, how to structure them right. Uh, who do you? What rights do you protect, and what rights can't you protect when when it, they're being violated overseas? Under what circumstances do you do one and not the other? And and this is why Rand, I mean, is so interesting when she writes about foreign policy because it, it, it's usually unexpected and and surprising what she says. It's not it's not obvious, and objectivism is not obvious. So I don't think I don't think foreign policy. I don't think these issues are easy. Okay, no, fair enough. And that's like I said, that that occurred to me. So that was my, my first foray into pragmatism. The okay. second, the second you get to relax a little more because it's more my issue and it's this pragmatist right that has been just assumed to be a fundamental right since 1890, at least when Brandeis wrote about it, it's the right to privacy, the so-called right to privacy. And we are seeing the consequences of people holding up privacy as a fundamental right, which I think is a mistake. I think if you are gonna talk about privacy as a right, that's an inherently pragmatic concept. I wrote a whole article on it. It's called Pragmatism and Privacy, but I'll just, you know, for people who aren't familiar with my view, I'll just say in essence that if you think about privacy, you will see that any time that you are protecting privacy, you are doing it using your property and contract. Yep. And a very eloquent example of that was made even more clear to me recently. And it, it came into my open letter to Tim Cook, which I have a link to in the program notes. And it is this, that these Apple phones have themselves become quite an example of how property can be used to protect your privacy. Apple has created a product that has a combination of features such that you can create a state of privacy for yourself and the information that you have in this phone, which the Supreme Court has noted is, and I think you and I would all agree that um, all, both of us, um, yeah. we'd, we'd agree that the information in here is more comprehensive about us than whatever could be found in the search of our homes. Well, and in in Apple computers, you can encrypt your entire hard drive you can create, yeah, you can create, you, we can text from our phones using uh, encrypted, uh, you know, WhatsApp or, or Telegram or whatever technology. I mean, Ayn Rand always said, what was it? Uh, uh, civilization is the process towards greater and greater privacy. Mm -hmm. And I think the iPhone and the, the, the texting apps and some of the video apps and all of this stuff is proof of that. We can encrypt everything, cyber, you know, the cryptocurrency, even though I'm not sure about currency, but the crypto world, the blockchain, all of that are technologies that are allowing us to be to, to own more and more of our data, to control more and more of how our data is used. Mm -hmm. And I think we're heading in a direction where even, even Google and Facebook and so on are going to ultimately in the end put us, 
without government, without anything, just because of the way technology will evolve, will have to recognize that we own our own property, uh, own data, and they'll have to they'll have to protect it much more solidly because the market will demand it. Well, and that's the whole thing, right? So if we voluntarily give our data to Google, for example, and they want to use that data to sell us a bunch of stuff and make money, then that's on us. You know, that's contract right. under what terms I give the data, right? Right, so right, right. The terms are going to change. Yes. And I think ability to, to, to limit the data we give Google is going to I don't know. Well, it just strikes me. And, and that's one of the things that the phone does. Right. So I read this whole fast company piece about how the newer iOS and the newer operating system on the Mac desktops and laptops, that those operating systems are making it possible for you to share very little with say Facebook or some of these other companies. And, you know, they say, oh, well, Apple has a luxury of doing it because they don't make money off data the way that Google and Facebook do. But nonetheless, it's a product that sells. So you can buy a piece of property and you can create more privacy for yourself using that property. I, I think it's just a wonderful, eloquent illustration. But that, that's, this is the diversion, right? Because my whole point is that pri privacy is not itself a fundamental right, that privacy is a state that we create for ourselves using property and contract, those can be objective. Anything that's privacy as a right is inherently pragmatic. And if you go back to the original article that Warren and Brandeis wrote in 1890, they say it is a right, but it's not absolute. It has to be balanced against the public interest. And that's sort of the introduction to the two stories that I've got here in the program notes. The first is in New Zealand, okay? But you know, all the countries have this same idea of privacy, that privacy, yes, it's a fundamental right, but of course it's not absolute, it's balanced against the public interest. And this horror story in the headline is that you're being faced with the choice in New Zealand, hand over phone password at the border or face a $3,200 fine. Now, right, that, it sounds to me like that is um, fake news. Well, okay, so this is CNN. Yeah, I know. And it's, you know, I don't know. There's a Customs and Excise Act of 2018 came into force this week. Officials will be able to demand travelers unlock any electronic device so okay. it can be searched. Anyone who refuses can face prosecution and a fine of up to $3,200, which is $5,000. Okay, well, that's better because the, the headline, I, I, I imagined, right, from the headline, that as you walk into New Zealand, they require you to hand over your pass code. So, but they have to initiate a demand for you. you you're not just expected to give them the pass code. Sure, but how much do you want to bet it is not going to be based on probable cause and particularized suspicion or any level of those that is appropriate for people coming across the border. Because on my view, you know, true, when you people are coming across a border, we could say things are a, a bit different, right? Because yeah. they're coming across a border, but you would need to have some level yeah. of cause, some level of particularized suspicion, particularly to get into a phone yep. again, I, which contains all this information about you. Right. And so what they're going to say is, oh, well, it's at the border and, it, you know, it's at the, we have to balance security, security, security. And so we have to do just random searches and demand it. And the mere fact that you refuse probably means something bad about you and ev everything well, else. So, a big fine. I mean, they, they want to find right. you $400. Yeah. No, I mean, this is sickening. Uh, and and I, my expectation is we're going to see laws like that in the United States. Uh, we're going to see more and more. Um, you know, people like, I mean, you know, there's people like uh, John Bolton, uh, Pompeo. Yes. I think many of the people in the uh, in the administration would love to see our privacy eroded and would love to be able to take control over, um, you know, over, over our phones, over other things. Oh, Sessions, Jeff Sessions is a huge anti-privacy guy. So, um, and, 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 you know, he's for civil forfeiture, never mind, you know, which is in some ways even worse. But, uh, you know, Sessions and, and Trump and uh, many of the kind of defense establishments are very, very anti-privacy because they, they want to fight terrorism and their whole focus is catch the bad, you know, catch the bad guys. And if a few innocent people get swept in in the meantime, who cares? I mean, that's just life.
No. And, and that's the thing. We just do not adhere to the idea that there should be probable cause and particularized suspicion. Exactly. And that is a principle, right? So yes. it's pragmatism to say, in the name of terrorism, we're going to violate people's rights left and right. We don't care because we have to protect them. No, you do not protect rights by violating rights. Actually, it's the same principle again as tariffs. You do not protect rights by violating rights. All right. Well, and again, it's it's that there are really not rights. Instead, there are these interests that you balance. Yes. And that would and and interests interests are really a proxy for what William James referred to as demand. It's yep. people demanding something. So in the classic test, the now classic test, it's a few decades old, for privacy, that you know, do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? Reasonable means is it something that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable? Does society demand security that somehow trumps to purposefully use the term um, yep. your privacy interest? So that's one story. The other is this other one that's kind of depressing for me and probably for you too, and um, has a few more wrinkles. It's the looming threat of comprehensive federal privacy regulation. Yep. And, and the fact that the tech industry is supporting this. Yeah. And I think they, they I actually, I think I, I think I put the wrong link in the program notes. Yeah, I did. I put um, some sort of climate change article as the Yeah, link. I was wondering how that's connected. <laughs> Wake um, up, old leaders, the long. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll correct that after we're done here. But um, that you can see the story, versions of the story in a number of places. This one, I believe, was Washington Post. Yeah, it was an opinion piece from the Washington Post. The tech industry is suddenly pushing for privacy legislation. Watch out. And they are suspicious because they think that the, you know, the tech industry is now behind this only because they want weak privacy regulation. Well, I think I think they're probably right. I mean, the tech industry wants to be able to control the process of writing the legislation so that the legislation handcuffs them as little as possible. And of course, keeps competitors out right so it gives them a competitive advantage because they're big and they're you know so it's classical classic uh, public choice it's cla uh, public choice is economic theory it's classical capture you know the, the, the once the tech industry realizes that the government and they realize that with with the facebook hearings that mm -hmm. the government wants to do something about privacy they're going to jump up and say oh hey okay yeah 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 we'll help you and and yeah. of course they'll help them by creating a biased product that, that favors them. Well, and, and moreover, they are already being faced with a pending, it's going to come into effect in 2020, California privacy legislation, which will affect, of course, a lot of them because they're here. Yep. Uh, and then the GDPR is into yep. effect as well. And so they basically want to say, look, uh, we don't want a patchwork of Tell the listeners what GDPR is, because I don't think. Oh, yeah. So the general data protection regulation is the one that's come from Europe. And it is affecting, of course, a lot of tech companies because they do business with European data subjects, as they're called. So they would like some guidance in terms of, you know, the government, I guess, protecting their interests. Uh, the problem I see with this is what, you know, of course, if they entrench this concept of a right to privacy in this legislation, they're just gonna make it even harder to make any reform in this area. The other thing is, you know, again, I said the Washington Post, the Washington Post was complaining because the tech companies are gonna to manage to get some regulation that's really weak. Yeah, They don't have any memory because I thought back to the first income tax. The first income tax was 1% of your income above a certain amount or something. What was it exactly? I went back and looked some days ago, but I can't remember. It was a really insignificant amount. And yep. some people would say, oh, you know, the tax is so low, it's weak. And that's how the first privacy legislation might be. It's going to be something that, you know, it's easy for the Silicon Valley tech companies to jump through the hoops. They're going to be protected from California law because it's going to, you know, there's going to be a supremacy element to it. You know, it's no federal law supreme over the state regulations, et cetera. But that's just going to be the first version of it. And once the principle is set that you're going to have federal privacy regulation based on a so-called right to privacy, that's inherently this balancing test, Soon as the government gets its claws in that way, yep. it, it's, 
it's over. No, um, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so they'll regulate all of these companies and that's going to be their way, you know, for, to take over and have some control over Facebook and Google and everything else, perhaps even content wise, they could use that as a, a door to get in. And how long is encryption and other technologies going to remain legal if the government is having control? No, over? it's a problem that, you know, so far the encryption companies have been able to stay ahead of government, but, um, but who knows? I mean, at, at some point they could seize the servers and, um, and, and, and take over the, take over the internet physically, but, but, but I, I so hear far, that there's some tech on the horizon about that internet piece though, that there, there's going to be a workaround potentially, but if they ban, for instance, the sale of encrypted phones, which some politicians yeah. want to do, they want to uh, say that the government is supposed Republican. to have, Republican. Yeah. yes, Ted Cruz no. among them. Ted Terrible. Cruz. Yeah. yeah. So somebody uh, says here, Jay says, objectivism is pragmatism without skepticism. That is reason and only reason is practical if your life is your value. So let's be very clear. Pragmatism is not being practical. I'm all for being practical. And, and he, I, I said the moral is the practical and the practical is the moral. But pragmatism is something completely different. Pragmatism is not related to practicality. Pragmatism is short-termism on on principle, it's short -term termism and the explicit negation of principle, the explicit negation of the existence of principle. As you said, it's satisfying demand. It has nothing to do with practicality. It's not related to practicality. Yeah, I mean, the way that James put it, the demand could be for anything under the sun. It doesn't have to be constrained by any sort of practicality concerns at all. It happens to be that people like to demand things that are going to make their lives better a lot of times, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can make all. No, and it's, and it's an explicit rejection of any kind of standard. Uh, other you know, the, the, the way I think about it, it, it um, on one of the times I was on with Tucker, he threw out the phrase at me. He always tries to label me in some way that's going to throw me mindless libertarian. And the way I wanted to kind of throw it back at him, if I ever get the chance, is that, it, you know, insofar as you could say a libertarian means something decent and principled, right? You know, libertarian is this broad tent, but he means somebody who's actually principled, right? Mindless libertarian is somebody who actually applies principles in different contexts for him. He wants to let that go and be a pragmatist. But, you know, if you have principles, then you don't go to the store and, you know, you check out at Target and they give you $10 extra change. You don't sit there and go, oh, God, you know, I wonder if I should give this extra change back to them. Hmm, let me do a calculation about whether Target is a big evil corporation and if I really need the money right now and the blah. You have a principle called honesty and you just give them that $10 and yeah, uh, call that mindless if you want, but I call it applying uh, principles. Sometimes applying principles are more that. difficult than that. But mindless. Because I mean, it would be mindless if you've never proved the principle to yourself. It would be right. mindless if you accepted the principle as a commandment rather than as a principle. But the idea of a principle is it's something you've proved to yourself. You know why you're doing it. You understand it. You just don't have to run through the whole proof every time you do it, but you yeah. know you proved it to yourself. Yeah. I mean, I'm using mindless in the sense as a shorthand for being able to operate on habit and not rethink yeah. every situation every single time, like recreate the principle for yourself on the fly each yes, time. But I would never use mindless as an example of that. It might okay. be an odd, odd you know, it, it, because mindless assumes that there's no mind involved, but there's a lot of mind involved. I pr pretty much I have to have the rule in my mind that any label he throws at me, I just don't even acknowledge it at all or touch it with a 10 foot pole because his labels are always fraught. So we've got a bunch of yeah. uh, I don't know what you want to do. You want to keep going or you want to. Yeah. So let me let me say one more piece of, of you yeah. know, sort of what what is a principled sure. approach to this stuff look like? Right. Yeah. Um, my view is if the government is going to obtain this information about you stuff in here. They should have to do the same thing that they used to have to do when they would come to your house, knock on your door and present you a warrant. This idea that government can now be entitled to be lazy and go to Facebook or Apple or Google to get the information that they used to have to come to you personally and present a valid warrant for is ridiculous. And Apple, through its technology, particularly encryption technology, has put us back in that place. And it shows how 
property really is the basis of privacy. If they support federal regulation, which is what they're doing out of pragmatic reasons, and what they're doing out of pragmatic reasons also happens to be entrenching a pragmatic view of the legal protection of privacy. So it's double pragmatism, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. They're going to destroy this wonderful value that they've been creating. Now they've been doing it to satisfy market demand. And because Steve jobs, you know, he felt like it was an honor to be entrusted with private information, et cetera. Uh, they're, but you know, I think Apple's run by, you know, less principled people than Steve jobs. I think Steve jobs was, it was an exception, but also what choice do they have to some extent, right? So something is going to pass. That's what they feel, right? They think something's going to pass. So, so they want it. to be involved in it. Yeah. It's like Exxon. I, I talked about this yesterday on the mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. Exxon is now supporting uh, a carbon tax because they figure a carbon tax is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Let's support at least a carbon tax that minimizes the damage and the we can control how it's applied, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is how this is how civilizations end. Now you said people have questions before I put you on the spot yeah, to we, help me shoehorn. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna put me on the spot again. Well, um, no, yeah, no, this is some, it's just a shoehorn. Yeah, we have money. Oh, we, we have, have money. Five cool. dollar questions. Um, throw me some. Throw me some. You know, money, okay. money, money, money. How can? Well, no, uh, that's the second one. The first one was. I mean, they're both big questions, so we're gonna have to come up with quick answers, even though they probably require a show just for themselves. This one we've actually, I've at least covered in the past. I think we did it together as well. Uh, Amazon and Google monopolies, most of the left and right both agree on that, and I do not follow the logic. So I'll just answer. No, they're not monopolies. There's no barrier to compete against them. They have a dominant market share, but that does not make them a monopoly. A monopoly, monopoly is, is, a, is an institution that actually has some uh, political force, some, some, some ability to uh, repress competition, and they do not. Uh, and... You know, Google, any one of these guys, I mean, look at Amazon. It barely makes any money on most of its business. And, you know, one big miscue, like raising their own minimum wage to $15 an hour, mm -hmm, could mm -hmm. substantially, you know, improve competition and, and, and hurt them quite a bit. Uh, I don't That's why they're that. lobbying to have the minimum the whole, wage. Everybody right? have $15 an hour. I know it's nuts. Right, right. Um, but it also turns out that the minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour actually lowers this wages for some of the employees because they're cutting bonuses. And yes, cutting I saw that too. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. But so so no, uh, not Amazon, not Google, not Facebook. I don't believe that in a free market there is such a thing as a monopoly. And and you know what is a monopoly? How does a monopoly behave? A monopoly behaves by raising prices and lowering quality. It, it, Amazon barely makes any money because prices are so low, and Google is free. So, and, and they keep improving the product. It keeps getting better. Well, and that's Google's, why Google's maybe not free in the sense that we are giving them so much information. So well, it's free, monetarily free. And yeah, I mean, there's always a trade involved. You're seeing advertising, you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Television was free, but you saw advertising. So um, no, I mean, there's no sense now that both the left or right. I, I would, I would look more like I would look a little bit to history because there have been these companies in the past where everyone thinks, oh my gosh, this, this IBM. is IBM. Yeah, IBM, Alcoa, AT and T, right? All of these had been seen, right? Well, AT and T As, maybe was because it was protected by government regulation. Well, okay, if it's protected, but, right. but um, Alcoa, uh, uh, Standard Oil, and and lots of other companies who who uh, Microsoft, of course. Mm -hmm. um, who have gone after because they have dominant market share and yet there's always competition. And if you leave the market alone, competition arises uh, no matter what. And even if it doesn't, it's private property. You just don't have any right to go and break up these companies. You just don't have any right to, to, to impose your will, your standards, what you think is right on a company. So yeah, so, so it's inefficient. So what? Um, uh, yeah, they're charging prices that are higher than what you could imagine they would be. Who cares? It, you know, private property, the principle of private property. So no, the are not monopolies, both left and right are wrong because both left and right are statists and, and their standards are not property rights. Their standards are not individual rights. Their standards are some, again, pragmatic view of, oh, we think uh, the cost benefit analysis, if we broke up Amazon and Google, there would be some social benefit to it. 
and there'd be some, we'd benefit more than it would cost, right? A pragmatic approach. We'd satisfy the demand of people out there who hate Amazon and Google, right? Yes. Right now, everybody's trying to appease the haters of technology. And it's not just Amazon and Google, because if you go after them, you have to go after Apple, you have to go after Facebook, you have to go after Twitter, you have to go after everything, because the beauty of technology is you get these giants to dominate, and then they can, you know, they can continue innovating in a competitive environment. Yeah. But yeah, Microsoft is a great example because everyone thought that that everybody thought Microsoft, you know, was just going to be dominant forever. And it's just not look at them. They're not they're not dominant at all. Nobody takes them into account today. Yeah. yeah. But that's partially because the government stepped in and and, and destroyed them. But think of IBM. IBM owned the computer industry in the 1960s and 70s, owned it. There was one other company called Digital and there was Cray Computers that did supercomputers. The three companies that IBM dominated 90 plus percent. And nobody talks about IBM today as a dominant country company. Um, all right, we got one more question, Super Chat. Mm-hmm. This one's hard, um, so you're gonna have to do it. Um, <laughs> okay. How can intellectual property rights be defined given that it doesn't require the initiation of force to use someone else's ideas? Okay, so you are initiating force. And well, for, okay, first of all, let's talk about, you said ideas. So it is not ideas that are protected by intellectual property. It is ideas as embodied in, for example, a play, a novel, an design. invention of some kind, right? So th- these are the things that are protected by, say, copyright and patent. So that's the first thing. If you make a duplicate, an unauthorized duplicate of a patented invention or a copyrighted work, what you are doing is you are stealing not a physical entity, but you're stealing a conceptual entity, okay? And we are not just merely physical beings. And we are capable of conceiving objectively an, an, an entity like a novel that is itself susceptible to theft. So there is indeed theft going on here. The mere fact that you can make a copy that is legible of Atlas Shrugged, for example, and other people who have their copies of Atlas Shrugged, they can still read theirs. You know, it doesn't prevent them from doing so and everything else doesn't mean that you have not taken something that you're not authorized to take. Um, now, why is it not pragmatic? Is that really the question? Go back to the question. because I want to make sure I want to well, the question is just uh, uh, what if it doesn't require the initiation of force, then how can we justify? Oh, so yeah, so 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 it is the initiation of force in the sense that you are taking something from somebody else on well, terms to which they have not agreed. That's right. I mean, it, the whole question is poorly thought of because if you think about it, every violation of a contract is non-initiating force. So if I don't fulfill my side of a contract, I didn't initiate force on you theoretically, right? Physically. But I did because mm-hmm. I create an expectation by signing a contract and then I don't fulfill it. Right. And, 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 you know, that not fulfillment is, is, a, is, a, is a form of initiation of force. Now, it's also true, though, that one doesn't define property by the negative. That is, you don't say, how can property, uh, how can this particular property uh, that, no, you can't say this particular property is property. Because if you initiate force against it, then it's taken away. Oh, you need to, you, I mean, the whole thing's convoluted, right? Private property like it, like is it's, not it's, differentiated. It's, 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 it's not property if you don't have to initiate force to take it. Is yeah, that so what he's saying, yeah, basically? Yeah. Okay, yeah. There's no relationship between defining what is and isn't property and between initiation of force. No, although, I mean, this is the thing, right? If, if we're talking about objective law, you want to... And this is why, you know, I have such a problem with privacy, the right to privacy, right? You, when you're talking about a violation of rights, you want to be able to reduce it to the physical things that somebody is doing yeah. that violate the rights of yeah. somebody else. And so in order to do that, you are actually talking about initiating force, either, you know, the, the physically or you could say constructively in the sense of threats yeah. or, you know, but, but, you know, if, if, if I am downloading something off of the internet and making an unauthorized copy of it, for example, the there's, the contract. there's, in there's, yeah, sense, there's, a, there's a physical thing that I'm doing that we can point to in the world 
That if I leave my computer at Starbucks on a desk because I've gone to the bathroom and somebody steals it, they're stealing it, even though they didn't initiate force on me. I wasn't there. And if you are writing the great American novel on it, they and could, while yeah. you're in the bathroom, they stick the thumb drive in the thing and they load it onto their thing, and you find, still have your copy and they still have their copy, they're still stealing. Don't define property in terms of whether you can initiate force on it or not. Property has a definition and then... Well, oh, okay, so can be, can be can be stolen in one. I think I, th I think the confusion the confusion yeah. is, and I, I had this debate a long time ago. There's a um, libertarian law professor by the name of Tom Bell, and he used to write about that intellectual property is welfare for authors or copyright is welfare for authors and stuff. And it, I, I think at root, you know, this is where you can't just take one issue and isolate it from the whole rest of philosophy, if people are skeptical about a conceptual entity like a novel as existing, that we can talk about it objectively. And that, you know, if, if they actually think that the only way that Atlas Shrugged, for example, exists objectively is if you put it in a physical book. Yeah. If they're, if they're that skeptical, yeah. then yeah, they're going to think copyright is welfare for authors because they'll think there is nothing that you can objectively point to as property. But as conceptual beings, we can define, you know, a, an idea as embodied in a useful invention, therefore patent, a Absolutely. novel that is sufficiently original and everything else such that it is this conceptual entity that regardless of whether it's on a Kindle or printed in a book or everything else, we know this is Atlas Shrugged, right? And part of it is understanding that even when it comes to land, land in itself is useless. What's valuable is what human beings do with the land. That's what gives something value. So it's the fact that all property in some sense is intellectual property or the source of all property is intellectual uh, is also an important idea You know that, that pe people are very confused about. They think there's the material world and the conceptual world. No, what makes the material world property is the application of the conceptual world onto it. It's the yes. work that's done onto the property. Yeah, that makes it a value to human yeah. beings. So going yeah i think we, we did a decent job with that one so here we go a couple of weird foreign policy stories for you to give me your take on uh, yeah yeah have you have you seen this one yeah 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 um kashagi kashagi is that how you pronounce his yeah, name jamal kashagi is a um activist right dissident he was he, a is, dissident. A, he is a uh was. South dissident was actively opposed to the current supposedly liberal regime was. in Saudi Arabia of the Crown Prince. Was. Was. And it he went into the Saudi embassy on some business and never came out. And I don't know that anybody's seen the body, but the story is that he was murdered inside the, the consulate or the embassy um, on Turkish ground. So the Turks either... Um, so it's in Turkey, but the Saudi consulate or embassy is where he was murdered. So the Turks upset and the Turks are politically actually aligned against Saudi Arabia. So they were they were they were supporting this guy. Um, the U.S. is upset. Everybody is upset. But this guy was a good guy. He was a, he was a relatively freedom loving kind of uh, secularist who was murdered, uh, murdered in Saudi Arabia by the regime because they don't like opponents. And this is part of a trend. So you didn't list the story in the thing, but about the same time, a Bulgarian journalist, a female Bulgarian journalist, mm -hmm. was raped and beaten to death uh, in Bulgaria. And uh, the suspicion is, again, that, she, that she, this was done to her because of her opposition and because she had written stories exposing all the corruption in the Bulgarian government. And then that is with one of several other journalists in even in Northern Europe who have been recently murdered uh, because of the stories they were writing and the kind of exposés they were doing. So there seems to be a trend in, 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 the, in, the, in the West, in Europe at least, of murdering journalists who are doing work uh, that is unacceptable to somebody. Now, and which of those Saudi countries would you really would you call the West? I wouldn't call Saudi Arabia the West, certainly. What about Bulgaria? Turkey is questionably kind of it's a NATO member. 
it's on the border of the West, right? It's not purely right. But this was done by the Saudis. I mean, this was done, and 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 as far as I know, um, Erdogan, although he's not talking about it himself, the article says that he has purposefully sent leaks out to basically expose the Saudis as guilty. Yeah, but remember, this is being done by a Saudi regime that claims to be moderate, that claims to be Western. No, I know, I know. And of course, I think all of this what it represents is. The fact that regimes all around the world and thugs, so put it this way, thugs all around the world feel emboldened that they can do whatever the hell they want. They can, and, and this is, think about the Russians killing those people in England with the radioactive poison and killing their own journalists and imprisoning, what do you call that, that band? Uh, um, oh, oh, um, Pussy Riot. Yeah, Pussy Riot. And I think, mm-hmm. I think one of the Pussy White singers, she, you know, she she's ill recently or something. Is she OK? Yeah, but this is, this is suspicious of the of the of Putin's government. So what you're seeing across the world is thugs basically suppressing speech, going after journalists, going after dissidents. And in the past, there was always you always could do that. But you knew that the United States would object and there would be consequences. They might be harsh, they might be minor, but there would be consequences, PR consequences. The thing about Obama, I mean, it really started with Bush, but certainly with Obama and Trump, the thing is that they don't feel like there are any consequences. Trump doesn't give a damn. He's not interested in Turkey. He's a friend of Saudi Arabia. He would never criticize the Saudis. Again, pragmatically, he doesn't believe um, uh, we should go after the Saudis. You remember him dancing. One of the first, the first foreign trip that, that Trump took was to Saudi Arabia to dance with the with the with the sheiks. Put his hand uh, on the orb with all of them. Ugh. He loves this new guy, this crown prince guy. He loves him. But but again, you can see it. You can see it. Uh, Trump has no leadership. He loves Putin. He's a friend of Putin. Loving Putin has basically sent a message to all the thugs and the and the strongmen in the world. Offered. You can by do the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, you talked you talked about Nikki Haley, right? Yeah. And she had her statement that she made. Yeah. And she was talking about how that, you know, that she had put on put pressure on basically these thugs around the world. And she made a special grammatical concession at the end. And yes, Russia, she said. Yeah. So she's clearly showing that I think she had different feelings about Russia than say Trump does. Just as well, I mean, she's going to run for president, whether she runs in 2020 against right. uh, Trump, which I hope she does. And I would definitely vote for her, although being Puerto Rican resident, I can't vote for president. But, um, mm. uh, you know, all she runs in 2024, but either either she's ambitious politically, she's smart, she's articulate. Uh, I, I think she would be, make a, a good presidential candidate. And, and I would certainly support her over most of the Republican field, unless you know, she does something stupid, which I'm sure she will, because we know that prior people who seem pretty good turned out to be pretty dumb. Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz being oh, one. But, but Ted Cruz, you have to admit, I was never, never. No, no. And you know what? So I used to this, argue with you. I yeah. know, I know. And and in my mind, I knew yeah. that, yeah, it's it's a risky thing to have. Well, we got Donald Trump sort of, Well, yeah. <laughs> But, it, you know, it's, it's a risky thing to have any sort of enthusiasm about a politician. And so even though I was very enthusiastic about Cruz, in my mind, I knew, OK, he's a politician. And so, for example, I shouldn't call you all sorts of horrible names because you were criticizing Ted Cruz. I never did. Did I now? No. OK, so no. let's go on to the next topic. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next one, actually, it's it's a related story, but it's different because it doesn't involve a journalist or a dissident per se, but it's equally alarming. Interpol chief, Meng Hongwei, is that how you pronounce his name? I think so. He's under investigation. And my question for you is, do you think this is a legitimate investigation? Do you think this is more evidence that China is going in the wrong direction? More evidence China going in the wrong direction. I don't believe any of these. I don't know what a legitimate investigation means in China. I think I think they use corruption investigations as an excuse to shift people out of power. He obviously pissed off the wrong people and is being shuffled out. I think this has been going on forever in China, but China's definitely, and there's been lots of stories about this, is definitely moving in the wrong direction. It's getting worse and worse and worse. 
and is moving towards becoming more of a totalitarian state. It's so far from it. And, and unfortunately, in China, you're seeing, here's the pragmatism coming, mm-hmm. you're seeing the tech companies, like in the U.S., completely cooperating with the Chinese government. And if China ever becomes totalitarian, it will be because the tech companies helped it. Uh, so uh, Alibaba and companies like that are the companies that are going to facilitate. And it's American tech companies as well. And For Google example, perhaps, right? Because yeah. um, there's, I don't well, know. Apple, Google, all of these guys. Mm-hmm. Apple is given uh, given all kinds of keys into the back end of, of phones in China to the Chinese government. Mm-hmm. I mean, Apple's not being principled in terms of China. Nobody has. And Google was for a while and is, is, is moderating its stance. Google was banned in China. There was no Google in China. And it, maybe there still isn't any Google in China because Google took a principled stand. But, but they're thinking of creating this edited search engine for yeah, them or censored yeah. search engine. Yeah. And, and what's happening now is um, American companies have sold them some of the best facial recognition software in the world. And they're using that to keep track of their citizens. They're using that to create these social scores mm-hmm. and to follow people everywhere and, 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 and identify. So to the extent that it becomes really, really bad, um, uh, it's going to be a consequence of the fact that technology companies have you know, sanctioned this regime, have helped them and, and have been pragmatic in their approach. Short term so gains. So since China is so bad, so them. since China is so bad, tariffs are justified, right? Uh, no, I mean, you could argue that since China is so bad, boycotting China right. is, is justified or going, you know, or, or positioning ourselves in a state of war with China is justified. I don't think it's quite that bad and I don't think it's a threat to the United States. So I don't support that yet. But if it gets bad enough, yeah, I think. I, I think- mean, trade embargo, we don't have to go to war, but we could do trade embargo at a certain yeah, point. Do you, and I don't, do you I have don't in your that- mind like what 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 it would be to justify a trade embargo? What would you say would be the, the red line? I mean, so- they would have to become a threat to the United States. They would have to clearly become a threat to the United States, whereas they were on a footing where they were threatening, like North Korea, for example, or Iran. Um, and they would have to, well, that would be enough, but, yeah, uh, yeah. but another cause would be if they really went all out authoritarian, all out totalitarian, if every aspect of Chinese life, if they went back to what it was like under communism, where, where, where the government controlled everything and it's nowhere near that bad yet, yet. So how about this separate question, which is regardless of you know, what our government should have as its position right now, you're saying it's not justifying an embargo yet. No. Would you, would you counsel American but, businesses who thought that by trading with China, maybe they were going to make things better over there. That was part of the rationale for having all of this business with China was making things better. Yeah. Would you tell those private businesses to rethink that themselves? Well, some of them. So, so those who are helping the Chinese state to become more authoritarian, yes. But other businesses, no. I mean, if you're importing, exporting, I don't know, fruit or just food, okay, whatever, or toys or, or or textiles, no. I I think I think at the end of the day, uh, the Chinese government is not directly benefiting from that trade in a in a way that other governments are not, and you're not helping the regime in in a way as to is to enslave their own people. And look okay. again, I think China's. I mean, if you think about how regulated and controlled the United States is. Yeah. I mean, China's bad, but so is the U.S. China's worse. But what is the principle here? So it has the to pr- be the principle is, yeah. Line. Yeah. Like, pr- principle is like, don't don't do anything to increase yeah. illegitimate government power. Which don't do anything don't do with, to increase. Yeah. Yeah. Don't deal with the Chinese government. Yeah. But I mean, that's the principle that we've talked about here at home, too. And this is why I have been against, for example, regulating Facebook to make them post all viewpoints and all this kind of stuff, because you're, you're handing government power. Oh, it's and if, you know, if well, you're, you're in the cause for freedom, you shouldn't. Be. I mean, it's, it's why I'm against having a, a ideological test for immigrants. It's why mm-hmm. I'm against a lot of things that people somehow think that they're fighting for liberty by expanding the role and scope of government, not just the size of government, the scope of government. I, you know, uh, we are for liberty, but let's build a wall. I mean, I, wow. I mean, I just let's have an internal police force that monitors the border and that secure, you know, that, that, that can harass me on the I-5 
uh, coming up from San Diego because I don't have the right document on me, but all in the name of liberty somehow. It's just, again, go back to the principle. You don't secure rights. You don't move towards more rights protection by violating rights. Yes. And true in China. So somebody, so Jennifer's asking, would stolen future income be part of it? I think she was talking about, I think that's the context of um, intellectual property rights, maybe, or in the context of um, initiation. Oh, she might be talking about copyright. Yeah. So if yeah. somebody is making unauthorized copies, then they are preventing you from selling copies, legitimate copies on yes. the free market. And that's future income. You're stealing future income. Um, I mean, the other thing about China, trade with China is you're not, for most part, you're not trading with the Chinese government. And here again, I would say, I mean, ideally, there would be some agency out there, not a government agency, a private agency or something, that actually told us which goods we were buying from Chinese private companies and which goods we were buying from Chinese government-owned companies. Mm -hmm. And we would avoid the goods that were being produced by Chinese government companies and, and only buy stuff from the Chinese private companies because because if they're private, you're, you're trading with Chinese guy and I'm all for trading with Chinese. It's the government I don't want to help. Right, right. And it might get more crucial to do that. I could see private organizations being capable of yeah, absolutely. delineate that as well. That would, would be great information to have. Okay. So here's another story that's kind of, and I'm glad you helped me out with the pragmatist angle on those two because I didn't have that quite worked out. But here are the Democrats being <laughs> pragmatists themselves, big surprise, right? These are just politicians. Yeah. And the title from New York Times Magazine, Democrats have an immigration problem. And in essence, what they're talking about is the fact that whereas a vast majority of people who label themselves Democrats now see immigration as something favorable, only a small percentage of those will actually hold their politicians, their Democratic politicians accountable for immigration policy. And what the New York Times is trying to urge the Democrats to do is to be more principled and consistent about. But what immigration, immigration policy. policy are they advocating for? What immigration policy is the New York Times actually advocating for? Because that's what I think the weaknesses of the Democrats, right? right. So they, they say they want more, they're anti Trump's immigration policy. And the New York Times points this out. So they anti ICE and they're anti this and anti that. But the Democrats, are, we, are Democrats for open immigration? No. Are Democrats for allowing anybody into the country who can get a job? No. You ask Bernie Sanders, and somebody did, in, in, during the campaign, I think it was Ezra Klein, asked Bernie Sanders. So I, he basically said, so I assume as a, as a left-wing Democrat, you're for open immigration. Mm -hmm. And Bernie said, oh, my God, no, of course not. That is a Koch brothers agenda item, you know, that would lower wages and it would be bad for unions and we can't have open immigration. We can't have people coming here and, 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 you know, competing jobs away. So the fact is the Democrats and in the, in, in the two thousands, when George W. Bush actually offered a comprehensive immigration reform bill, it was Democrats that killed it mm -hmm. because they don't want more immigration. What they are is anti-Republicans, anti-Republican immigration plans. But the thing I think to point out about Democrats, they have no immigration plan. And for those of you who think that the, that the Democrats' plan is just open up the borders, it's not because the unions oppose it. The unions are very anti-immigration. And because the Democrats don't believe in uh, competition for labor. So because the votes, I mean, they don't want to lose very much against it. On the contrary, if it, the one type of immigrant the, the Democrats want are dependent immigrants, are immigrants that don't work, old people, young people, very, very young people, people who just consume research resources and don't work. That's but they can't say that they can't actually they can't have an actual agenda item. So the problem with the Democrats is they have no immigration policy. It's, and it's, people accuse me, oh, you're on. You have a leftist immigration policy. No, I don't. That's insane. You don't, you know, people who say that have no idea what the left actually represents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. So it's, you know, there are specific ways of enforcing immigration law that the Democrats have poised themselves against and made a whole bunch of noise about, but they're distracting from the real issue, which is they too lack 
a principled approach to immigration, a, you know, a pr approach that says, if you're going to have immigration policy, have it centered on the principle of individual rights. Government, when it's acting in this realm, just like any other realm, shouldn't be acting except to protect the individual rights of Americans. And that's it. And there is nothing like that in any of the Democratic agenda. And even though the New York Times is complaining that the, you know, Democrats are not about that, I'm sure that that's not what they would want to articulate either. No. Um, yeah. No. So <laughs> they probably want to bring in more dependents and vote in more. Oh, so so they say I'm not a leftist, but I'm useful to their cause. <laughs> uh, you guys are insane. You don't know what you're talking about. All right. Yeah. OK, so we yeah. got to go on. I mean, I, I mean, you should tell Antifa to stop demonstrating my talks because I'm useful for, for Antifa's cause. They should they should be promoting my talks. Uh, another issue that the New York Times is now jumping on is climate change again. And you were talking some about this because of the, the model that was released recently. But suddenly there is this big call because the UN's climate change change uh, climate panel is warning that we have to take end. drastic. World's going to end. World's going to end. Just like it did in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000, 2000. Yeah. 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 I mean, to me, the approach on this, not being an expert in climate change at all, the approach to me that has made the most sense has been what I understand Alex Epstein's approach to it to be, which is that, yes, there probably is some change that occurs because of CO2. But I think you were also talking about this on your show yesterday. It is much cheaper and more beneficial for human life and human flourishing on this planet to address any of that using technology, you know, air conditioning, if it's a little bit warmer and all these different things, as opposed to, um, you know, making huge drastic changes in lifestyle across the board in the hopes that you're going to affect this in some way, which nobody can really predict because the climate models are not even very good anyway. No. You know, and, so and what I talked about yesterday was the economist who just won the Nobel prize for economics right. is an, he wanted for developing models that calculate the economic cost of climate change and propose taxes, carbon taxes, in order to reduce climate change, reduce carbon emissions, which they say will reduce climate change. And, and, um, and of course, the models have been around for a long time and they keep refining them. But yeah. the models, are, first of all, they're garbage. But even if using his own models, it turns out that the best policy is actually to do nothing. Now, he won't admit that. But that's what another economist by the name of Peter Murphy Peter Murphy or Kevin Murphy, one of the Murphys, has actually proved that using those models, if you do the math right, if you do the, 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 the discounting cash flow right, then the best policy, which is completely consistent with Alex's point, is to do nothing because you leave people free, they innovate, we get richer, we, 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 we can handle whatever the climate throws at us 50 years from now, we will be so rich, we'll be able to handle it easily. Yes. Except for the privacy regulation is going to make us all poor, but that's... Well, yes, well. But, but then if you add privacy regulations on top of Robert Murphy, somebody corrects. I think it is Robert Murphy. But it could be Peter Murphy, because Peter Murphy is also a good economist. Um, anyway, it, 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 yes, you add privacy regulations on the carbon tax, onto tariffs, onto a whole string of other things. What you get is a much slower economy, and then the innovation doesn't happen, and we all die gruesome deaths of, you know like in Venezuela, where they have 1.37 million percent inflation. I saw that yesterday. That's horrific. That's incomprehensible. Yeah, I know. I, I cannot. I cannot comprehend it at all. I mean, I'd have to do the math. I'd have to pull out my calculator to figure out what the daily inflation is, but it's astronomical. Now, I, right. know, I, know, I know you've abandoned us in California. We have a sliver of good news you from do. California that I've put in the program notes. Again, the program notes are at don'tletitgo.com if people want to check them out. This is a an account from New York Times. It's just a reporting on a debate between the two gubernatorial candidates I, in I California. Think the liver of hope here is in California is it's actually a Republican. It, the two Democrats didn't win the primary and are not running one against the other. A Republican actually made it into the thing. Now he's going to lose in a landslide. You think so? Yeah. That's why I say sliver of hope. That's what no, I, yeah. Not even a sliver, huh? Oh. 
so sad. The thing that I liked about him, the thing that I liked about him was that while they tried to, you know, impute on him all of the conservative social issues positions and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He said, no, that is not what this campaign is about at all. It's about the economy in California and middle class jobs and housing and things like that. So be, being able to live an affordable life is the way that he put it. He's just saying that government has just made life here way too expensive and that he wants to address that. The one thing where, uh, you know, I, I think he would take a quote, Republican conservative position that I don't like as much, you know, he wants to get rid of sanctuary cities. Sanctuary cities are sort of a way of people pushing back on unjust immigration policy. But, you know, he, he is just saying that maybe he would not, as a California governor, push back against federal immigration policy the way that a Democratic governor might. But other than that, you know, the fact that he's saying, I'm not running to change anything on social issues, he says one iota, I'm running to make sure people can have an affordable life. If you can have a Republican that focuses on just that, that's the yeah. type that we would like. Well, we'll see. I mean, he's, he's got money. He's rich. Um, we've had other Republicans run as wealthy businessmen. I, I just don't, don't see it. Anthony asks, any thoughts on Milton Friedman's statement that you can have immigration and no welfare, welfare, no immigration, but you can't have both at the same time. Anthony, I answered that question yesterday. Exactly the same question. Was it, I don't know if it was by you, but I literally answered exactly the same question yesterday on the show. So you know, and my answer was basically the proposal I have for immigration, even today, is you you allow for anybody who can get a job in the United States to come to the United States on a five year visa that has to be renewed and you have to show you have a job. And so you open up the borders to anybody who has a job, who can who can connect with a job. OK, so. Yeah, that sounds that sounds right. And they don't necessarily have to be citizens. Um, other than that, I've just got a couple of frivolous so, little so things, I, I, you know, while I don't, while I don't have any problem with, I, while I think, I, I think the economics of this are pretty clear that, uh, just from a pure economics perspective that, uh, you know, immigrants are net benefits to the U S economy. There's no question in my mind about that. So you could, I think the freedom would be wrong, but so somebody's saying I'm inconsistent because I'm not protecting individual rights, but look, you know, any transition from where we are today to purely laissez-faire economy is going to involve a period in which rights are not 100% protected. That's just the reality. Because things are so screwed up today, you have to transition into laissez-faire capitalism. Just, just saying, tomorrow, um, we're going to do away with Social Security, we're going to do away with Medicare, we're going to shut down every government program, we're just going to go laissez-faire 100% tomorrow. That's not Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand never thought that. Or like I've heard some people say, taking my foreign policy and distorting it, we'll just nuke these people and nuke those people and nuke those people over there and we'll be tough and that's a proper, I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, that is not an objectivist approach to transitioning from where we are today to full laissez-faire, uh, you America first, true America first foreign policy. That is rationalism par excellence. That is par Rationalism, par excellence. So, uh, what what you yeah, need? You, you is have a to be super careful. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, you, have be, you have to be super careful because, for instance, as in the you know financial services industry or whatever, if they remove a control from one area while they have in place some sort of you know subsidy or insurance or whatever in another area then suddenly these people are going to make risky investments and then you have bubbles and disasters. And then what do they do? They blame capitalism, but it's not capitalism. It's this mixed economy that hasn't been deregulated in the proper way. So no, it, the whole thing is, the whole thing is absurd. How to deregulate the banking industry is, is so complicated, complicated and so yeah. hard and you would have to develop so much expertise. But I, you know, I know people who are objectivists, particularly if they're, if all they've done is philosophy and, and they don't know much about the real world, then it's easy. Everything's easy because everything's a floating abstraction. But to actually get into the nitty gritty of how the world works, which Ayn Rand was brilliant at, I mean, I think, and I think the benefit she had primarily was. Um, now, to be clear, she was a novelist. 
people, people who have only done philosophy, some of them are reality oriented enough to know what they don't know. So, okay. Not all of those. Not right? all of them. Okay. Some okay. of them are not. And, and yeah. the younger they are, the less reality oriented they tend to be because they've had less life experience and they know less about the world. Mm -hmm. And I think many of our current uh, leading objectives philosophers were young ones. And, you know, I think we're, we're rationalistic and admit, admit that, you know, and, and have told stories about that, right? And it's easy to be a rationalist when you're young because part of escaping rationalism is really... Um, is, Bumping it, your head you know, against a wall. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's, it, it's, right. it's gaining experience, yeah. gaining life experience, gaining the concrete, gaining the concrete that, that flesh out your actual philosophical knowledge. All right. Um, somebody said I'm fighting Jesus Christ. I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Hmm. Um, the problem of reading, uh, reading the, uh, the, the, ch the, the chat while, uh, while it's going on. And, well, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to apply my oh, Pareto me? principle to you, what you're seeing on the chat as well then. Okay. Uh, and see what you think of my Pareto principle. 80% of the unpleasantness social media, your comments on your YouTube feed, whatever, comes from 20%, if that, of the people who disagree oh, with you. It's 1%. 1%, so, well, you would say? No. Yeah. No, the 1% who disagree, the people who disagree with me the most, right, which is probably 1% of all the people who follow me, is it probably right 80% of all the, the commentary on my stuff, particularly the negative stuff. So it appears- not, not everyone who disagrees with you is writing really horrible, you know, kind of insulting. I, I don't know. Yeah. There's some people disagree with me who are nice about it, but they're not many. Yes. Not many. Most of the people disagree with me are nasty. That's the impression that you get? Yeah. 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 At least the ones who write on uh, the comment, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, there are many people. And who this don't... is more on YouTube or is this everywhere? It's everywhere. It's everywhere. So maybe people are generally nicer to me because I find that it's a small minority of the people who disagree with me who are actually. So you have people who disagree struggle. with you who are actually respectful and nice. Yes. Wow. Good for you. I love I have it. People like that. Very, yeah. very, very few people like that. I mean, they could be quiet because maybe they're afraid to disagree with me because I have this reputation of being such a nasty, nasty person to people who disagree with me. Um, you mean like me about Ted Cruz? Yeah, you were like, so but, evil. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we're still friends in spite of the fact. Can you believe that? that? You, you were wrong. Yeah. How could that happen? Um, now somebody's saying I'm not pretty enough, but I assume you are. Yeah, I'm reading. I'm reading. Uh, or I'm could reading it be that I block out people of I, out of context? I, I do block people when they're really nasty. How about that? Could it be I, that? It takes a lot for me to block somebody, but I have blocked. It takes quite a bit for me to block people too, people but I do. I do. Yeah. Amy, you're bloody awesome. Thumbs up. Yes. That's what Jonathan says. Now, I don't think it's Jonathan Honing. I think it's a different Jonathan. A different Jonathan, okay. Uh, and he listens to your podcast. And uh, anyway, there's a whole argument going on in the background of all kinds. And then somebody says, you're very pretty, Iran. It's okay. That's Brandon says that. Okay. But somebody else said I'm not pretty enough. Hail and place. Okay, I think we're wasting time. And we I are. We are. And I, do you want to talk about this this uh, Nazi downstairs? I mean, is this? I'm this not is sure. something that people. I mean, it's just it's a very interesting story. Yeah, it's an inspiring story. I mean, she sounds quite heroic, yeah. and the whole thing sounds quite fascinating. It's a story. Where is it published in the New York Times? Oh mm -hmm. my God, it cannot be. They kind of get be, lots of value from the New York Times people. Yeah. Lots of value. Yeah. So do I. Um, um, so I, I would mention it, but then we're going to have to say goodbye. That's fine. That's fine. And you mentioned, we'll, we'll mention this and we'll mention my little musical thing. I'll give them a story about that and then we'll go. But yeah, this is headline Nazi downstairs, Jewish woman's tale of hiding in her home. And she was evicted from her own home in Vienna. Yep. And ended up sneaking back in and living upstairs in the home that she was evicted from while the Nazi who evicted her was downstairs. Yes, and so there's a whole Nazi bunch of letters. Partially responsible for the for the final solution, the, 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 the motive of the Jewish people. So, you know, it's quite a story. And then she has now identified a piece of art that belonged to her. And there's going to be the piece of art is going to be auctioned soon. And she's at her family 
is actually going to get a percentage of the of the. See, this this is the thing that I think is so cool, right? So the reason all of this history comes out and can be documented, maybe they can make a movie or you know write some great books out of this. The reason is because of the value of this art. So all of this documentation was well, necessary to show the provenance of the art. That's you I know, saw the art. That's not very valuable. Well, to some people it is, that's fine, but whatever, this is, you know, this is how it happens. Objectively, the art is not valuable. It might have monetary value to some people. Objectively, this art. I I don't care for it either. Actually, I'm only looking at it closely for the first time right now. A seven-year-old could do better than this. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, But it is interesting because of the story behind it. It's for 12 to $14 million. Um, Okay. I wouldn't hang that up. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tack that up to my wall if you if you paid me buy it and then it's going to shred through the shredder right. sorry um it no goes, so okay so you pitch your thing and then i have to pitch my thing and then we have to pitch the general thing and then we can go because i've got i've got to go okay. to- i'm just gonna say go check out dmas that's in the program notes uh the guitarist is the boyfriend of Haley mary from the jezebels that's how i found them if you like oasis supposedly you're gonna like them they have melodies it's melancholy but whatever they have melodies it's awesome i like melancholy music yeah so i think i think you will like that song in particular your own and then my other plug is just come follow me over at my blog at don't let it go.com and go follow amy you've still got a patreon i do I do. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. So Let's help support me. Amy on Patreon, support me on Patreon. I've seen a little uptick the last few days on Patreon. So thank you. And I'd appreciate any more upticks because there's still a long way to go. Um, and let's see, what did I want to say? Oh yeah. I've got this big event with Eric Weinstein on Saturday. If you're in the New York area, if you're anywhere around the New York area, please come. There's still tickets available. Uh, you're going to see, um, uh, what's his name? Dave Rubin and Eric Weinstein and, uh, Dave, I, I think there's a little reception afterwards. You get a chat with Dave, you get a chat with Eric, you get a chat with me. Uh, and uh, bring friends, bring friends who are not objectivists, bring friends who might find Eric Weinstein interesting or might find Dave Rubin interesting. But let's pack the house. I mean, there's no way they're going to let me into the intellectual dark web if we can't pack the house for an event like this. It, it has to be sold out. It has to be standing room only. And then they'll say, oh, oh okay, there's, maybe there's something this year on, guy. And they'll they'll invite me into the intellectual dark web. Um, of course, prob- people probably think I'm a sellout for be- even wanting to be part of that. But anyway, uh, I'm reminding you again to Patreon, support the show. Uh, Amy and I are probably going to do this again on the 30th. That's the plan. Of October yes. Because yep. I'm traveling from tomorrow on. Go to the ARI auction and and bid. There's a couple items there. That oh, okay. I will. Yeah, there's the ARI. The yeah. era, a gala on Friday, which would be great. I know a lot of you can't afford to come, but you know, the thing about Eric Weinstein event is it's free, but the gala is on. Somebody asked if the if the uh, Eric Weinstein will be recorded. Yes, of course it will be recorded. It will be live streamed on the Iron Rand Institute live stream page on YouTube and or Facebook. I'm not sure. It'll also be on my YouTube channel afterwards and on the Iron Rand Institute YouTube channel afterwards. So um should be it should the whole thing should be uh should be interesting and um subscribe to my youtube channel and mine too i'm getting close to the 1000 subscribe 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 and share 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 the best way to get new subscriptions is if you share to your friends and with that thank you amy this was fun thank you Uh, it's a good show thank you all for being here we had a good 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 attendance and um I'll see you, Amy. On the 30th. We'll talk before, I'm sure. All right. Bye, everybody.